Good morning, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We will wait for two more minutes, and we will. Start. Akash, do you have anything to present, or you will be the, or orally itself? Thank you. So yeah. So what I was thinking was that, like you know, it would be great if this can be more like interactive than like you know just me giving, showing some slides and just going through them uh, and making this like making this session like very like one dimensional so i thought it would be more uh, like better for everyone but this this like session or whatever you should be going to call this can be a bit more interactive so like i think yes, it would be great if if we like treat this or this this is what I, this is the uh, this is the idea that i have had, that i have about this that it might be nice that if this can be more like a like you know like a phone call with a, with a friend whom you want to ask about, okay, like how to go about, like, you know, applying for a PhD program and so on. So, yeah, yes, that's, sure. that's what I think. Okay. So, good morning to one and all present here. Uh, for coming and joining us in this event. That's how it's done. Today, we have with us Mr. Akash Gupta. He is uh, al one of the alumni of IIT Kanpur, uh, where he completed his aerospace engineering in dual degree in 2016. He joined the PhD program in 2017, and during his tenure, he has also saved an MS in planetary science, geophysics, and space physics in 2019. Having advanced in candidacy in the following semester, he now researches on the formation, evolution, and dynamics and habitability of planetary bodies, extra solar and solar. He is also a proud recipient of future investigator in NASA, Earth and Space Science and Technology, Finnest Grant. Over the years, he has gained a number of scientific as well as administrative experiences, which uh, with his understanding and insight on the selection process of PhD candidates, he is delighted to brief us. And we have uh, really have pleasure to invite us, invite him uh, in this evening. Thank you, Akash. We really uh, appreciate your efforts. Thank you. So, uh, over to Akash. Thanks, Robert. And again, thank you so much for like you know having me here and giving me this chance to share my experience with all of you. So. So again, as I was saying only a few couple of minutes back, I think it would be great if we treat this call as more like a conversation with a friend. Like, you know, just think of like, you know, that you're talk, reaching out to someone and you would just want to ask about, okay, like how do you apply for like a PhD program? Uh, just because I think that way we can basically ask about what exactly all of you are like, you know, have doubts about or like are really interested in knowing because a lot of things you can really know from like, you know, just Googling stuff, but there many times there happen to be like some specific questions that you are like, cannot figure out how to go about them. And so we could also in this manner, like address those things. And so, so again, but that being said, I've uh, based on like, you know, the inputs that Bhavya and others gave me about like what uh, all of you would like to hear about, I have, certain things that I, I think I would like to go over, that I have planned to like go over. So I'll go over all those things. But again, as I'm going over all those things, feel free to like interrupt me and like, you know, ask whatever questions you have. But before I begin with any of this, uh, I would like to emphasize that like, you know, the things that I'm talking about here, like we'll be talking about are simply based on my own personal experience and perhaps what I know from like, you know, how some of my friends have uh, gone at, like how the experiences that my friends have gone through in applying for grad school, for PhD and so on in the US or in Europe. So, but again, but this doesn't really, so like, but I of course cannot like, you know, speak for everyone really, like all the people who apply for uh, like PhD programs, different people will have their like have their own perspectives, have like you know have their own way of approaching things. So the things that I say 
it's not like that is exactly how things are supposed to be done or that's exactly how things happen. Uh, there can be many different ways. So I would also encourage you uh, and the people who are organizing this to like to ask others, pe- uh, others or like you yourself should like, you know, perhaps reach out to other people you know who have, who are doing like a PhD program right now because it really helps in understanding the different ways you can approach this, uh, this process uh, and basically understanding the different perspectives different people have. So anyway, so, and again, like before I begin on to like, you know, uh, about like, you know, what an SOP is supposed to be about or how do you go about a number of things connected to SOP. Uh, something I would like to emphasize before is that, okay, now I do not know, uh, so sorry, so again, so I'm, Perhaps forgetting forgetting this. So, is this supposed to be about like the PhD program, like applying for PhD programs, or just like graduate programs later on, or specifically just about it? more specifically to PhD programs? Okay, sounds good. So, so yeah, so for the PhD program, so like you know, the PhD programs are typically like a multi-year like commitment. You will be committing for like five, like four, five, six years. Like typically it's like five years. So you'll be committing for a really, really long time if you decide to go for a PhD program. So you really need to like, you know, ask yourself, is this really something you're interested in? So now I'm not trying to like, you know, discourage any of you uh, from pursuing PhD. I'm doing that right now. And I enjoy the, uh, like, you know, doing, working on a PhD. But this is definitely something that we need to, like all of you need to ask if you are really interested in PhD, because this will be a long, really long uh, commitment. And so you should ask yourself if, uh, like, you know, if you really like research and are really enthusiastic about it, if you do, if you really like this, then, uh, then definitely go for it. Like if you really like that Eureka moment uh, like, you know, feeling that like, you know, when you perhaps solve a problem and you really like that moment when you realize that, oh, how the solution is supposed to go, uh, then definitely go for it. And if you have experience doing research and you have enjoyed it, definitely go for it. But do ask yourself this question that do you want to like, you know, spend five years of your uh, life on this? Because that is a big commitment. And so do not follow, like, you know, do not go for this just because your friend is going or just because many of the people are going for this or that's like, it's like, you know, it. Yeah, so do not do this because of these kind of factors. Do this because you want to or because you are really interested in uh, like, you know, doing a PhD, only then go for it. Yeah, because again, there are a lot of, amazing things that you could be doing uh, but and PhD in itself is like really amazing it's like it can be like really fun but again it can only be fun for you if you really do enjoy research so okay so moving on one of the things that uh, your organizers asked me to comment on is that like you know how to figure out the SOP like what to work on when you're trying to figure out the SOP now I'll be I thought of giving this, so I have this like rough uh, guideline in my mind that how we should be approaching, like, you know, when we write an SOP and that is what I would like to share with you. So basically writing an SOP is really basically, basically about writing your like a story about like, you know, your life. Where, uh, so the SOP is really supposed to be a story about like, you know, yourself. It, it, which needs to include like why you are motivated, first of all, like, you know, so what is the motivation behind uh, the fact that you are applying for the PhD program? You need to like, you know, show that you can, ex- like you need to express your enthusiasm for like research, that why do you want to pursue research? Because this again is like really important. Like, because many people can have like, you know, good grades and, uh, research experience, but something also that is really, really critical is that if you are passionate and if you can really persevere for like four or five years, so this is definitely something that people look for. And if you're passionate and enthusiastic about pursuing research, so you need to show your motivation. Then, 
Then another thing is that, like, you know, when you're writing an SOP, you should definitely mention if you have been through stress, uh, been through some struggles over time and like how you have overcome them. That because that really shows that you have this, you have the tenacity to like, you know, first to keep continuing despite difficulties, because if you really like or want to like, you know, achieve something. So do mention that if you have had struggles over time for whatever reason, because of financial reason, because of health reasons, and because of some other reasons, do share them there. Uh, like when it does, like do share them when they when they do, like, you know, when, so like when, so if there have been issues which have like hampered your, uh, this process of like, you know, acquiring education, like high level, high level education, high, high level education. And, but despite all those, like, you know, issues that you, like, you know, you worked hard and you overcame them, you should write about these experiences that if you have had in the past. But again, but the most important thing about, uh, about like, you know, applying for a PhD program uh, is going to be your grades and your research experience. Those two are like, the most important things. So make sure that your grades are good. Like if you are like, you know, still in your like first year of grad school, master's program, or you, you are still in your undergrad. So make sure that your grades are good. But along with that, also try to acquire research experience. Because that is also really important because that will really show the person who is reading your SOP that you know what you're getting into. And it also, and one of the best things that you can do is get a paper out, if possible. If you cannot, it's okay. Uh, most people actually do not have a res uh, like a research paper, research publication before coming to school, uh, before joining a PhD program. But if you can, that will really help your application. And but one point to note here is that do not try to get a publication from like, you know, any, uh, like a low quality journal, because that is sometimes like possible that, so quality is something that is valued a lot in academia, sorry. So quality is valued a lot in academia. So, so try to like, you know, do not try to take shortcuts, try to, uh, and I, I mean, I'm sure you're working at IT Bombay. And so if you're working with some researcher at IT Bombay, I'm pretty sure that is not going to be the case. But yeah, do not try to take shortcuts. Uh, and like, you know, even if you cannot pu publish, it's all right. But try to get some research experience. Try to work with some faculty at uh, IT Bombay. And like, you know, because another thing will be your letter of recommendations. And your letter of recommendations will... Uh, like the people who will write a letter of recommendations, it will be great if they have seen you working on research and if then they can in their letters, like, you know, say that, uh, express how interested or how enthusiastic you really are about pursuing a PhD or working on like any of these science problems. So uh, research experience is like really important. If you can do papers, if you can get a paper out, that would be amazing. And so in your SOP, you should write about, like you should describe the research that you do. That's like really important. You need to describe the different projects that you have done and yeah, like how you have gone about them and, and like, you know, what the key result has been. But something you need to remember is that, okay, I will come back to that in a, later, but do not, you do not have to, so like there will be a number of things you will be writing in SOP, in an SOP. So do not try to, so you, but you will have to keep the whole thing short and concise and like to the point. So, so yeah, keep that in mind. So, and so, okay. So apart from research experience, you, you should describe if you happen to have some teaching experience, if you have like been a TA for, for some course. So describe that. Uh, like mention that it's not as important as the research experience, uh, 
uh, but mention that if you have teaching experience because uh, when you join grad school you might have to teach i mean it's highly likely that you will be a ta uh, during your phd program then also mention like the different awards and different things that you have won over the years mention them very briefly uh, but do mention them and then also mention if you have uh, like if there are like if you participated in different like extracurricular activities so do mention them do not go a lot into them like do not uh, this should not like you know dominate your sop but do mention them briefly but yeah do mention them and especially if you have uh, especially mention if you have worked on like you know things like uh, edi like equity so something so like equity diversity and inclusion if you have worked on these subjects uh, you should definitely like write uh, write on this and finally you should you should write like you know the people you would like to work on uh, because like for each university you will be writing a different sop so at the end i think you should always write the different things you have uh, worked on and why uh, sorry 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 uh, I, i miss spoke there so discuss like whom would you like to work with uh, at the university you're applying and why exactly you're applying there sorry i miss spoke there so again so when you write about your struggles your motivation your research and research experience and then teaching experience awards and extra credits this will basically like you know and like where you are applying by you are applying there with whom you would want whom you want to work with this will this will basically like you know once you have written all this stuff this will give you a general framework more or less because the last part you cannot you, and because this last part that you that i talked about that like you know discussing uh, whom you would like to work uh, work with and like why so you can you will have to tweak that depending on like you know where you are applying to different universities you have to like you know, tweak this uh, tweak this but more or less you will not have to change all the like the uh, the initial things that i talked about motivation struggles research experience teaching experience awards uh, these kind of things but when you're writing about all these things make sure that uh, do not try to write this uh, as a story as in try to like you know connect like that this happened and because of this this happened or like this is what motivated you and so you try to explore this and then this and then this but again this is one way of going about it you do not have to necessarily go at this but i think this is a good way of going about it because i think this is much better uh than writing uh, like passages which are completely like you know independent or writing in a manner which is a, like where each each uh, paragraph is like like you know very different from each other so okay so what i'm trying to say is that when you're reading something like you know if let's say professor is reading your sop then make it so that they want to read it like you know continue reading it so like if you read a story book like a novel or something uh, it's always more engaging when like you know uh, like oh, sorry so what i'm so like a novel is more engaging uh, if it's if it's like you know if it flows logically or like if different paragraphs are connected with each other if someone just gives you like disconnected pieces of information well it is just going to be a disconnected Uh, an article with disconnected pieces of information and it is not going to be as interesting uh, if it like you know flows very smoothly because that will make sure that the reader is like you know engaged which is important and so again uh, and while during all the during the story you will have to make sure that you express your enthusiasm and why you are interested in this and another important thing is that keep this short and like you know to the point because there is always like a word limit or character limit for these sops or like personal statements whatever they are called uh and the fact is that if all departments like all the universities receive many many applications every year and so that is why you do not want to like you know 
uh, overexpress yourself or i think that's not the right word but so you want to so like you know you in your letter you will you will want to express the main points about yourself like as strongly and as quickly as possible because you must have like you know experienced this yourself that if you have to read uh, let's say a book chapter which is like really really long like 100 pages long one book chapter 100 pages long you will get bored no doubt about that but if it's like you know much more concise like, like it's a 10 pages long Okay, like 10 pages long is also really long, but still like something that is like, you know, shorter and to the point, it's like much more easier to like you know, read about it. But if there's, if you're reading something, which is like, you know, just repeating the same sentence in like different ways, which often happens, uh, it can get boring for the reader and they might get disinterested and which is something that you do not want. So something very, very important is that you have your SOP read by many of your friends, like, you know? So, so have your SOP read by many of your friends and writing the SOP or personal statement, this will not be a quick process. You will have to go over this whole process like again and again, like multiple times. You might have to do this like 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. But the thing is that, as I said, once you have it, you can just tweak this, tweak your SOP slightly for like, you know, as many universities as you're applying for. But do spend a lot of time on writing SOP. Do start it early. Like the applications are probably, application deadlines are probably around November, December. Do not start writing your SOP at the very last moment. Do not start it in November itself. Give yourself a couple of months at least. So like start it like a couple of months before the deadlines. So that you can write it. So like, you know, you have the first draft, then you can show it to someone and they can give you like points on, pointers on uh, uh, like, you know, any grammatical mistakes or any, uh, like, you know, any issue with how you're expressing yourself in your letter. And again, have it, have many different people read it. Uh, and because again, like different people might pick different aspects of your, like, you know, uh, might be able to figure out like different uh, issues that might be there with your SOP. And like, it's totally okay, like, you know, to, to ask others because like, like let's say X, Y, Z, there are three people X, Y, Z and all of them are applying for this. Do not, I mean, one might think that, oh, like, you know, X, Y, Z, all three are applying for the same program that, so like, do you want to take help from the same person who's applying for the, like from a person who's applying for the same program more or less? Do uh, not get into that mentality. Like take help from each other because it's only like, you know, by helping each other that you guys will be able to, that you guys can be like successful together in applying to uh, like a PhD program. So getting feedback is very, very important. And so for that reason, start early, so for instance, your first draft might take you two weeks to write. So send it to someone. They might give it to you back in a couple of days or a week or so, because all of us are always busy, of course. And so once you get it back, you will have to spend another two weeks perhaps. And then you should share the draft again with these people and so on and on. And because another thing is that also like, if you give yourself a lot of time, another thing that will happen is that like, you know, something, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but something that I do all the time is that, let's say I write an article today. And when, like, when you're writing an article, you of course, like, you know, read it yourself and try to make sure that everything is right and this and that. But after a point, like after you've read your own article, like, you know, 10 times, you stop being able to spot mistakes in it. And so if you ask for someone else, uh, like oftentimes there are like very silly mistakes that we have made, which if you were like, you know, which you yourself can pick out very easily, but just because you have, you have been like, you know, writing the whole thing, you, have, you just read, wrote the whole thing and you've already read it 10 times. Uh, it 
it kind of becomes hard to pick like, you know, uh, little mistakes, but your friends can help you in figuring those things out. Similarly, if you yourself give yourself, like, you know, if you give yourself also like a week between working on the same draft like twice, that also will give you, like, you know, you yourself will be able to figure out a lot of silly mistakes. This happens to me like all the time. So again, give yourself a lot of time on working on SOP. And all right, so another thing I think uh, they wanted to, me to talk about is... Yeah, Akash, actually there are many questions uh, popping up and uh, many of the things you have already answered while you were uh, telling us about. So uh, in brief, uh, like first question that has come up many times is what are the things one must be careful to not to write in an SOP? Do not lie, first of all. Mm -hmm. That's like, I guess, the most important thing. And so, and what not to write, like, but like what, so like, can you give me an example of what you, like whoever asked this question, like what, what, uh, what are they thinking of when they are saying something should not be written? Let's say one person uh, worked upon various fields of his research. I mean, he has, has been working throughout his career in different fields. But his focus to uh, move into university uh, or to a professor is focusing on one specific field. So would writing on different fields which he has worked upon help him or not? That's a very good question. So let us say you have worked on over the years, you have worked on like subject like topic A, topic, topic C, topics. And let us say you have also worked in industry or for a year or so on some topic X. So my suggestion would be that do mention this topic, like industry X work that you did, do mention that, but do not go a lot into the, like, do not go into the details of that unless it is connected to the work that you want to do uh, with like during your PhD program. And then when it comes to research, like your research type, your research, let's say you have, as we were saying, okay, you have worked on topic A, topic B, topic C. And it is topic A that you want to like, you know, continue with during a PhD. Then definitely emphasize more on topic A. But we mentioned topic B and topic C also. So, okay, so that's one way of approaching it. Another way to approach this can be that, can be like this. If you think that your experience, that the experience that you gained while working on topic B, topic C, and your industry experience X, if those can also help your profile, uh, sorry, those the whatever skills you gather, like you know, you learn, you gather while working on these different problems, uh, will help you in your PhD eventually. Like you know, during your PhD, then do put it that way also. So this is where the storytelling comes in. So storytelling is again important because one way to like, you know, a story can be like, okay, you explored these different things. You tried industry because you wanted to explore, experience it, okay, how things are in industry, but you need to like, you know, stitch that experience into this, into what you are interested in right now that, okay, you could say, you could say one example can be, again, do not think that I'm giving good examples, but this is just an example. Like, you know, approach this the way you think would be best uh, or also talk to other people. But okay, so one way could be that, okay, you wanted to experience different things. So you tried our industry, but then you realized, that, oh, but research is something that is what you were really interested in. So you came back, you, you like, you know, you did the master's and you really ex uh, got more experience in research. And now you want to like, you know, further this and go to uh, for a PhD. But while writing all that, you can also say that, well, that being said, I did uh, acquire like, you know, this and this skill while working and something, uh, and that can help me in uh, pursuing like, you know, whatever PhD projects or like that, those skills that I acquired while working in industry, let us say, can be, can benefit me in uh, in so-and-so PhD problem, uh, in so-and-so, in working on so-and-so like research problems. 
uh, the kind of problems that I'm interested in working on with this and this professor. Similarly, if you worked on like uh, problems B and C, you can connect them also that, oh, doing, while working on problem B, you learned this. While, while working on a uh, research topic B, you, you learned this and this. So for instance, let's say you learn very basic example, very crude example is that, okay, while working on prob research topic B, you uh, learned Python. So you can mention that, well, this is a, a skill that I acquired and it will help me. Again, this is a very crude example that I'm giving right now that perhaps many people can understand. Uh, but yeah, you can like, you know, say these kind of things. Or maybe you, uh, during while working on problem P, you acquired some machine learning skills. And so then you can say that, okay, I uh, so all this, uh, these like you know, these some of some of these like machine learning fundamentals that you learned during while working on research topic B is something that you could apply for furthering work in uh, the field that you are interested in because there are these upcoming methods that are upcoming machine learning methods that are being applied to your field of interest but and this is something that you can bring into your like you know the research group that you are trying to apply to. Uh, so things like this, try to connect things. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, you have uh, some uh, of time on things. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, many people, I wanted to ask questions, but uh, I just want to say to, to the audience, if they want to ask questions, they can raise their hands and they are messaging also. So uh, Debajuti Bhakta is asking, as all universities ask for minimum two LOR, I take my first LOR from my MTech supervisor. Can the second uh, one be from a BTech supervisor, or it should be specifically from a uh, MTech professor? Well, it can definitely be from like you know your BTech supervisor. No doubt about that. I mean, if that is a like if you, if you worked a lot with your BTech supervisor, uh, definitely ask for that person. Uh, ask them for your for a letter of recommendation. And something you guys can also make sure is that, or something you can also do is that you can also, it is, well, okay, so take this with a grain of salt, but typically it is also okay to ask someone that if they can write you a good letter of recommendation. Okay, if so for instance, if you're unsure, like, you know, if this person will write you any good record of recommendation or not, uh, it is totally okay if you if you ask them that if that your XYZ, if they can write you like a good letter of recommendation. Uh, so that is like, okay, to ask, definitely. Uh, a follow-up for this question itself is like some universities do ask for a third letter of recommendation. So who uh, could be probable third person to ask for? So, so let's say you have only worked with two people, two professors, okay? So if you, you have only done research with like two professors, okay? What else you would do then? The third person can simply be someone you have done a course with. So you did a course with someone and you interacted with them a lot during the course. During, during the course. So you can reach them because perhaps by interacting a lot and by getting a good grade in that course, you were able to like, you know, develop some rapport with that person. So you can reach out to them and ask for a letter of recommendation. It is okay if you did not end up like interacting with uh, the instructor a lot, but if you did do very well in that particular course, then again, you can reach out to this person for a letter of recommendation. Okay. Uh, there's one question from Abdul Kader Puniwala. Uh, He's asking, does full-time teaching experience of about uh, five years because uh, he has done it, would help in this uh, SOP? Like mentioning it would help. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this will help you. And so like you can like you know, dis discuss in your SOP that uh, like what kind of teaching experience this was. So you can like, you know, tie this into your like you know, what you are interested in right now. Oh, sorry, okay, so I did not put that. Uh, uh, so again, so do describe, so like, because that seems like a substantial amount of teaching experience. So definitely discuss that. 
and like you know and maybe you are interested maybe teaching is something that you are inherently is interested in or like this is something you have been interested in for a while so mention this like you know as part of your motivation also that like you know you are interested in doing phd and ultimately one of the things that you're really interested in is like mentoring students uh, like you know teaching them in the coming years apart from like continuing to do research and you can say something like you know that being able like getting phd and the experience that you gain through phd will help you in in being uh, and like whatever professional development that you will go through during that process will help you in a, becoming a better teacher better mentor to like future generations or something like that but yeah definitely mention that no doubt it's hard to quantify how much which can help but yeah definitely should definitely okay yeah. so uh, the next question is coming from pratha ash ashji uh, she is asking is mphil necessary for phd are there any benefits of doing mphil uh i'm assuming so like uh for the us technically there is no like you do not need a masters before that you do not if you are getting one i mean that's good you 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 can use that time to like gain research experience or to just expand you like you know the different subjects you know about uh, so you can use that but you do not need it so necessary that being said in europe you do need a masters to pursue a phd in europe it is different uh, than in, in the us in us you do not need it but in the us the phd's regardless of if you have a masters or not are for like 5 years and in europe they are for 3 to 4 years but you do need a masters to apply for a phd program in europe uh the next question is coming from way he is asking uh, does a lr from an industrial supervisor count uh yeah so i do know friends who have done that so i myself do not have any industry experience so so i'm not saying this from like you know from my personal experience but i do know friends who have done this because again like you know what are you trying to what letter of recommendations are trying to do is they are trying to establish like credibility for you if you are like you know a good student someone who is works hard and these kind of things so that is what these letter of, letter of recommendations are for so yeah i think that can count but i think it would be preferable if you get some research experience work with some faculty and ask letters from them and let's say but let's say you have to write but if you think like this industry supervisor can give you like a very good letter like, recommendation and they themselves have like a good reputation let's say in the industry uh they has to ask for definitely ask uh, them also letter of recommendation oh uh so next question is coming from uh, youtube is asking that uh how to choose a university or a college and uh, for the specific college how to like what is the main point that would make an sop strong sorry uh, so that's not here right not in the in call messages so that's an, sorry can you repeat yeah, the message yeah uh, okay, okay. Sorry, uh, the, yeah the question is how one should choose uh, between different universities if is the topic or the research field working there in the university is same and other point is uh, how should one make a sop stronger for that university so yeah so like you know if you if you have already figured out a number of universities which are which all which are all working on the kind of research topic you are interested in then what you can simply like first of all one thing you can really do is ask your like research supervisors if you are working with someone go go to them because they are like they are a great resource so take advantage of that talk to them about these things do not be shy in like you know reaching out and discussing these things with them openly they can be yeah like 
they are amazing resources. So definitely reach out to them. Otherwise, what you can also do is that you could also simply go with like, you know, you can try to figure out if like, so, so first of all, for a PhD, what the thing that matters the most is your advisor, like the reputation of your advisor. That is, that is what matters the most. The university is secondary. That being said, if you're not decided on what that topic you want to work on, then my personal suggestion would be try to go for like, you know, uh, the best university. But I'm saying like, quote unquote, best universities because for a PhD, so like try to figure out the best university for your research topic. Best university for computer sciences can be very different from, like, you know, ranking of best universities for computer science can be very different from ranking of best universities, universities for astronomy. So try to figure that out. Uh, okay. One more thing. So one more thing is that yeah. when applying, try to apply to a spectrum of universities. So what, I, what do I mean by this is that do apply for universities, which are you think might be like, you know, It'd be awesome if you could get, but they're also kind of hard to get into. So do apply to them. Then do, then apply for universities, which you think you should be able to manage, uh, like, you know, medium level. Uh, so yeah, middle level, which are like middle. So yeah, so like middle level universities, middle level in the sense that you think you can manage those universities, given your profile. Then also, man, also apply to some like backup universities that you think you're like, you know, your fallback plan. So have a fallback plan also. So apply to a spectrum of universities because this process of like the graduate, uh, the PhD program application process can be very, can love does play a part in like, you know, PhD application process. And sometimes, uh, the, sometimes, the committee which is deciding, which is trying to decide who to pick or not, have to deal with like you know very, very tough choices. And so so for that reason, like you know, do apply to a spectrum of universities. This is like really important. Like do apply to a spectrum of universities. But yeah, okay. So uh, okay, so next question is from Abdul. He's asking, uh, and first of all, thank you for the answering the previous question, one of his questions. Uh, he's saying that would a uh, if you have a friend working in the same university you're applying to, would it help if you get a, a LOR from that? Because the friend he has, he uh, is his friend from undergraduate. No, now, you you cannot. So if that, yeah, so this is something you cannot do. You need to ask for like a recommendation from uh like a professor or your like you know your, your advisor who has been your advisor uh, be it a professor and industry supervisor is still okay but not from a friend uh, even if the friend is working as a professor or in that even if the person is working as a professor you should not be asking them because that person cannot comment on your cannot comment on your capacity as a researcher because they have not mentored you uh, because here you are asked the universities are asking for for letter of letter which can describe your research potential or like your, your research experience or uh, how you have done in courses and these kind of things so so yeah so i don't think okay. i could be wrong about this but uh, to the best of my a friend. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, I'm uh, you have muted yourself. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah. okay. so the next question is uh, from 
Nehal Banzal. Uh, he's asking, how would you contrast, like, what is the differences between Europe and US specifically uh, for SOPs? Or SOPs won't not be too Okay, so I, I'll just like read. So, I, yeah, I, I'm seeing these messages in the chat. So, I think I'll just read them. So, okay, so Neil up is saying, could you contrast PhD in Europe versus in the US? So, the main difference is that PhD in the US are for five years, PhD in the Europe are for three years. For the US universities, you do not, a master is not necessary. For one in Europe, it is necessary. Uh, why? Because in the US, the PhDs are structured such that in the first two years, you will typically be focusing more on the courses than on research. And your last three or four years will be more focused on the research. In your, uh, I mean, in the first two years also, you will be doing research, but it will be, you will be doing a lot of courses also. Whereas in, in Europe, PhDs are three to four years because in those three, four years or whatever, you will be too completely focusing on, on like on your research project. You will not be, you will not have to do a number of courses in Europe. So that's like the fundamental difference um, between a PhD in Europe and in the US. But yeah, do tell if I did not answer exactly what you wanted me to talk about. Yeah, uh, Nilab, you can unmute yourself. So the thing is, um, I'll be graduating with a master's. Uh, I'm enrolled in a dual degree program here. So that master's well point is not really applicable. In that case, what points can you think of that can help us take this decision? Because I'm just very confused about this. So, so, I mean, definitely there are like multiple factors. One thing is that, well, because you already have your master's, you can apply to, you, you can apply in Europe to a number of university universities. So I think, so, okay, so before I go on on that, so do make sure, so I think some universities do say that you need to have like a two-year master's. I'm not totally sure about what this point. Uh, so I could be totally wrong about what I just said, like, you know, that you do need a two-year master. I'm totally wrong, so sorry about that, but I just do not remember this. But if, but I think you can, you should be able to apply to a number of European universities because you do have a master's because you are a dual degree student. Okay, so if you have, if you get your master's, so the advantage of applying to Europe will be that you will only have to spend three, three to four years for getting your PhD. Whereas in, if you apply to, US, you will have to spend one to two extra years. So there's that thing. Uh, so try, you can try to decide like, okay, how much time you want to spend, like, you know, getting your PhD. The other thing can, that something you can think of is that, do you want to move to US? If you want to move to US perhaps, then getting a PhD in US might be a better choice because that's where you want to move. If you want to move to Europe, let's say, uh, maybe getting a PhD in Europe might be a better choice. Uh, so this is another thing you could like, you know, think of. And also like, if you are coming back to India, then yeah, again, something you can also like talk to, uh, you can try to decide like, you know, what is it that faculty, so let's say you want to come back to India in industry or maybe as a faculty or something. So you can think of, okay, what is it that universities in India look for? And like, you know, new faculty or like people who are applying for faculty jobs in India, are they okay? So yeah, like do they value like, you know, a US PhD more, a European PhD more, so on. So you can, this is another thing you can think about. Uh, hello, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, yes. so sorry, could you, could you just give me a minute? So I, I, I think there are a couple of, Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Okay. The thing is, uh, is there any age criteria in uh, for PhD in US or Europe? Let's uh, one second. Yeah, Akash, you're muted. Yeah, so there is no age criteria uh, for PhD, I think, to the best of my understanding. Like, yeah, I don't think there is any 
age criteria. But yeah, getting back to Nilab's question. So what else you can, so like, so okay, so these are like, but still like the things that I just talked about, the, the two facts at least that are coming to, that I described, that, that were just coming to my mind right now, they should be secondary to a degree. The primary thing that you should take into account is like, you know, what are you interested in working on? And if there's someone, some particular person you might be interested in working with. So that is like the primary thing you should take into account. Like, you know, or deciding where you want to go, Europe or US. Well, actually there are some other things also. Okay, so another thing is that in the US, uh, English is the main language, everyone speaks English. So things are just easier. It's easier to like, you know, settle in the US. It's like the transition period might be shorter for you. Whereas in the Europe, in many countries, the local languages are different. So that it, it you might have to put in a bit more effort to to settle in in a in a European country. But this is not necessarily like you know. But then again, like experiences can be different. The work culture is different in the U.S. in the versus Europe. So, so there are multiple, no, a number of things that you uh, might want to think about. Uh, other than that, yeah, other than that, another thing is, um, yeah, okay, so like these are the things that are coming to my mind right away. I'm sure there are other things also that were one can think about when applying, like when trying to decide Europe versus US. But yeah, uh, yeah, these are the things I think that are coming to my mind right away. But again, I think do this, do, do talk to other people, like you know, people who have done their PhD and who are doing their PhD right now in Europe versus like you know, and people who are working doing their PhD in the US. Uh, so uh, this next next question from Modi. Just one, right? So, how do we go about searching the relevant professors in a So again, so if you're already doing research, try to look at like you know. So if you're already doing research, you must be reading some research papers and stuff. So try to see, try to figure out the people whose work you're interested in, and because that should give you some idea of like you know, because so like that can be the starting point if you are already doing research with someone. Other thing you can think about is that, okay, what are the research topics that you're interested in? Once you know the research topics, then uh, another way could be to just look at them. All the universities that are out there, like, you know, and try to go through, like, try to look at your departments. Like, let's say you are in the mechanical engineering department. Then try to go to the mechanical engineering department websites of all these different universities and try to see which professors, like if there are professors working on the topics you are interested in. So again, this is a slow way, but this is this is how you will have to go about it. Uh, and this will really tell you, give you a good idea of like, you know, where, where you can apply, where you, you would want to apply. And the thing you can think about is that, is that, so like while trying to, when trying to like you know, narrow down to which exact universities you want to apply for, you can think of, you can tell another thing you can take into account is that uh, how many people are there at a particular university who work on your topic. So let's say in University X, there's only one person who works on, on the topic you're interested in. Whereas in University Y, there are five people who are working on the topic you're interested in. So you might want to like, you know, and so, and let's say you only have like one, there's only one university that you want to apply to. Then you, you should choose University Y maybe uh, over University X. But again, here I'm assuming that you're not interested. So like that your research interest is relatively broad. Because if you're interested in a very, very small, like, you know, narrow topic, then most likely you'll not have like five people uh, at one point. But both are good. Like many of us really do not have a very good idea of like, you know, what exactly we should do. That's like totally okay. Go there, give yourself the opportunity to explore. If you have not decided exactly what you want, want to work on, that's like totally okay. 
Okay, uh, so there's next question from Firoza Praveen. He, uh, he's asking, sorry, she's asking, which points are emphasized for writing a synopsis in PhD? Uh, synopsis in PhD? You mean? Uh, Firoza, if you're here in the meet, can you unmute yourself and please explain a bit? I guess she's not here. So, moving to the next question. Uh, I guess uh, the question from Pitha actually is not much relevant because uh, she's talking about PhD in West Bengal. So, but the thing is, we are talking about funding university right now. Uh, uh, Purva is asking, is cold emailing professors acceptable before applying that university? Like asking for what uh, are you working on and all those things, professors. So, I mean, if you if you want to know what that particular professor is working on, you should go to their website and you should not be emailing them to ask about that. Go to their, most of the people have a website. If you cannot find their websites, you can go to, I think IITs have access to Scopus, a C-O-P-U-S. So go there, search for the professors, like, you know, name, and look at their research papers to figure out what to work on. So if that is something that is already you are interested in, go to like you know, these places or Google Scholar and try to figure out what this will work on. If you want to know, but so so yeah, I don't think you should cold email. Definitely do not uh, do mass emails to professors. Definitely do not do that. That is the last thing you would want to work on. Uh, you would want to do. Do not mass emails professors. But one case, in one case where you could email professors uh, is to, to reach out. So like you can definitely reach out to people to ask if they will be taking PhD students in the coming year. Because the fact is that like, you know, it is pretty expensive when you're applying to different universities. So it, I think it's totally okay if you want to ask uh, so let us say at some university X, there is there are only two people, or like let's say one person who who you might want to work with, you might want to work with, but uh, and like you're really interested in working with that one person, so you definitely want to apply to that place, even though you there's only one person you are interested in working with. But if that person is not going to be taking new students, uh, then like you know it will be a waste of your money to apply to that university. So to just make sure that like, you know, something like this doesn't happen, you can email professors, but it often happens that they will not reply because they are like very busy or because they get like many emails from many students or like many emails in general. So, so do not feel down, like, you know, if you do not receive a reply for them, because believe me, uh, professors get many emails from so many people. So it's like, and yeah, so like, do not feel like, you know, uh, disappointed or discouraged if you do not hear back from them. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, but that is, if you are emailing for that reason, I think that's totally acceptable. But again, Keep it, keep your email short and concise. Do not, yeah, do not write a very long email. So, okay, so I'll just go over these other questions. So, okay, so Apurva Asthana is asking, can I get into a PhD program just by talking to that specific professor with whom I want to work? Uh, so like, yeah, I'm assuming you're trying to say, you, if you do not have to apply, uh, go through the application process or like write an SOP. If that is what you mean, then for the US universities, no. For the US, US universities, typically, I mean, you do have to do like, you know, go through the whole procedure. In some cases, however, in like very, very like rare cases, uh, a faculty might decide that they do want to get uh, take you and it might be like, you know, but in, even in that case, you will have to write SOP and everything. But that happens in very, very rare cases. In Europe, however, it is different. Also, sorry, so also in the, in the US, uh, the application process is, 
uh, like the department, it is typically the whole department that decides which student to take in. So typically it is not your professor, like the person you want to work with that is going to decide if, uh, if the department wants to take you in. Typically that is not how it is. So, so, so for that reason, it doesn't matter if there's one person who's, who's like really interested because it is a department which will have to take you in as a student or not. So for that reason, US typically you have to like, you know, do the whole process. In the Euro, you know, it, this can depend from university to university. In many places, it is the professor who decides if they want to take you in or not. And once the professor is ready, uh, like, you know, has decided that they want to take you in, uh, beyond that, it's like a straightforward process uh, to get the admission letter. Uh, but again, this depends on place to place. So for instance, one of my friends got an EPFL, which is in uh, Switzerland. And for his admission, it was really his interview with the professor that mattered. So in Europe, this is, so this is a one way in which things are a bit different. It is the professor which decides if they want to get you in, like take you as a student or not, and not the department. But again, this again in Europe can depend from university to university, but yeah. In many places, it is more professor centric, the admission process. So, okay, so the next question is how much weightage is for the transcript as compared to the research experience? I don't think I can, anyone can quantify that. Both are important. Uh, both are very important. But research experience is definitely something that can outweigh, even if you, if you happen to have like, you know, uh, relatively poor grades good research experience can outweigh uh, like relatively poor grades. So there's that. So, yeah. so that's what I think I can say on that part. So other than, then can, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, so other than research relevant work experience like industry experience, is industry experience, is sorry, other than relevant research relevant work experience like industry experience is worse to have for PhD so I'm assuming here the question is that does it, having industrial experience help in getting a PhD? Then yes, and like in multiple ways, I think I'm, I'm assuming that that's what is being asked here. Then I think, please correct me if that's not the case. So I think it can help in different ways, definitely. But I I would not say that like you know that will give you more advantage. Uh, that will have so I think an industrial experience can help you in the, in like different ways, as in like it can make you like you know, it can it can give you a different set of skills, and you can it can give you more experience in like or like you know it can give you it can train you more in achieving deadlines in like a set manner, which is like something you do not gain when you are when you are always in school, like when you are always in like when you have all, only been in college, yeah, you do not get that experience. Um, like experience of working on for like deadlines and like other things like managing your own time i think these are the, these are the kind of skills that you really develop when you're in industry much more than probably when you, than you are developing during your college time so i think so there's that uh, could be helpful maybe is like you know if you are doing research in industry but more or less it is really the research component of things that will really help you um, for your, in your application to PhD. But again, experience in industry can teach you different tools. And so all that can contribute. So, I mean, industrial experience can definitely contribute in your application to PhD. So yeah, so I think that's what I think I can say in short for that. So the next question from Nina is that what are the requirements for doing a PhD in the US, in the US I would, and also in Europe. So I think for that, you should uh, go to the websites of like the, the university you want to apply to, uh, because there they will have, they will have all this in detail, like what exactly are the requirements, all the universities have different requirements, but typically you just basically, basically need a bachelor's or at least a bachelor's for a PhD in the US and in Europe, we can depend again, but typically you need a master's to pursue a PhD in Europe. That's like 
more or less the requirement for all the other things uh, i think you should you should refer to the specific web, uh, to the website of the university or the department you are interested in applying to so do another question is do journals accept manuscripts only if there is a professor as a co-author no that is not necessary that is not at all the case uh, but yeah that is not at all the case so if the work is like you know new research and is of good enough quality i think journals will accept your manuscript uh, so for this i think you should if you think you have uh, you have done you have done on your own some like, really great work and you think you can publish then uh, you can like you know uh, you can apply to you can try to submit your own paper in fact i do know one person personally who did the same thing uh, that person published a paper before joining phd as like a single author so those kind of things can happen uh, and like you know when you are trying to apply to a journal it goes through a peer review process so like your paper will be reviewed by other researchers in the community if the thing it is worthy enough to be published then it can be published but working with the professor will give you like you know you will be able to use their experience and uh, and their knowledge you will be able to leverage that in writing your paper and in becoming a better researcher and you will most importantly you will also get you will also have someone who can write you a letter of recommendation so okay so another question is do you get to choose your own supervisor in europe or is it assigned to you so again this can depend like you know from place to place in europe typically again this might not necessarily be the case but typically uh, you choose your own Typically, like you choose your supervisor in the, in the sense that you reach out to some particular professor and then you start, then you get in this conversation with that professor and they interview you and so on and on. And so in that sense, it's a, you choose your own supervisor. And US also, you can choose your own supervisor, but it can depend from department to department, from university to university. Typically in the US, it is that a you are admitted in a department and then while in that department, you can reach out to different people, you can gain experience and like you can, you can start working in some research group and you can get experience in working with them. And in that manner, you can like, you know, start working with some research group, but so yeah. Uh, okay, Feroja, you are there in the uh, meet, you can unmute yourself and ask the question, what do you want to the synopsis? Uh, sir, what uh, what are the procedures uh, for writing a synopsis in the case of PhD? Uh, so synopsis, as in, are you talking about like a PhD thesis? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So for a PhD. For a synopsis, I'm assuming that you're you're saying that you like how to write a, a summary for a PhD thesis. If that's what you're asking, is that like basically like you know whatever you do during the five years or whatever of your PhD, a summary of that is what will go in synopsis of PhD thesis. That is what you were asking. It is basically whatever you do during those like you know, three or five or six years, wherever you are, depending on it will just be that. Typically, in many cases, it ends up being like if you publish papers during your PhD, it is your it is your synopsis or a summary of the PhD will basically be a summary of all those research papers that you write. Okay, uh, so just uh, one more last question that's not there on this chat that's coming from YouTube. Uh, they're asking like uh, what since you might have also written many SOPs, <laughs> that's most evident. The thing is, 
now after gaining so much of experience what mistakes do you think you did at when you were writing uh, an sop and uh, how would you do it them now like what the, uh, would you do differently if you write a sop now well while writing sop see the thing is that you hardly ever read your sop again <laughs> after after things work out but to answer this way uh, to answer this question in a somewhat different way what i can say is that i think i should have i like, you know worked harder in my first two years of undergrad so i did my undergrad in iit kanpur but yeah i think my first two years or so i didn't really do very well in my courses and stuff so i should have like you know worked hard on those things but i guess i was just a bit burnt out from je and stuff so maybe that's something i should have done better but what else i think other the other thing can be that i should have tried to be more to the point in whatever i was like you know discussing in my sop because many times you think that oh like you know many times it seems like to me or like to us many times it seems like oh i have done like so many things like you know over the years and i want to tell them about everything that's like really good that like you know you are enthusiastic about like you know all sharing all the things that you have done that's like great that you have been working on different things but what you need to also make sure like what you also need to uh take into account is the mental state the person who is reading your sop will be in you know because again they will have to read go through the person might have to go through let's say 100 sops and so you the best thing that you can do for your application is to make sure that you emphasize the key points of the application as quickly as possible in as short way as possible and as strongly as possible like in the most impactful way possible and so for that reason again i think it's be really great if you do have your friends proof your your sop and work on the draft like and again and again have your friends proof your sop and so on and on so yeah, i don't know i didn't exactly answer your question but yeah it's just not coming to my mind but i think these are the things which are pretty important okay uh mana you can uh, unmute yourself <laughs> actually we are uh, it's way beyond yeah. the time limit got up but yes you uh, can yeah, uh, sorry i'll uh, just make it quick uh, yeah i wanted to ask that uh, like sometimes the entire journey I, i mean it has been quite sort of boring or you don't have a story as such which you can write in the sop and you said you asked us not to lie right so i mean is this common that you feel like there's nothing to write in the sop i mean what do i write in my story if i uh uh like do you, what was your story for example did you have something which you, you occurred to you immediate to write in your sop like nothing as such occurs to me like i do i'm doing this uh, stuff which i'm doing i'm studying it because i like it but that's all there is to it i mean there's no at least at the moment i can't think of any deeper meaning to it or some uh, dramatic story which would uh, go on for a few pages for example Oh, okay so i think i did not like express this well so i do not at all mean that like you know it needs to be dramatic or anything so it is not at all so i'm not at all trying to say that that is how it is supposed to be so okay so like a research paper so a research paper is also supposed to be written as a story so like you know when you i don't know if you have already written a paper or not but like when you are writing a paper your research advisor might tell you that okay your research paper needs to be a story So when someone is saying that, 
we are not no one is at all trying to say that you need to be dramatic flashy or like you know anything like that not that is not at all what i'm trying to say the main idea is that there should be a logical flow that's the main idea there should be a logical flow to your to your sop if possible okay okay but And, isn't an sop required to like catch someone's attention i mean sort of isn't that the point i, I am I'm just correct me wrong that's what i heard i mean yes and no so like you do not so again so you so uh it is definitely supposed to catch someone's attention and so for that reason i was trying to say that uh, you should try to like you know emphasize the key things that you have done over the years uh, your motivation if you have done like you have struggled with something or like the research uh, your emphasize your the research projects that you have worked on the awards that you have won or some other like extracurricular activities that you have engaged in that la that last part of it briefly but so i mean so and so it is supposed to like you know catch someone's attention because it's supposed to be the highlight of what you have done it's supposed to be the this highlights really of what you have done over the years so in that sense it is supposed to catch someone's attention it is supposed to be typically typically it is only supposed to be a page to page and a half long so it's not supposed to be longer than that and so when you're writing oh, like sorry, recipe, how long is it supposed to be can you just repeat typically it is like one to two pages long and that's it okay so so that's why like when you actually write your so what you will realize is that any research project you cannot write it for longer than three or four lines typically i mean depends on how many research projects you have done and this and that but like for a rough uh yeah so like roughly you will you should be writing like three or four lines for a research project let's say if you have done a couple of research projects so but if you like if you have only done one research project then yes you can write for longer of course you can emphasize it more but but yeah so like it's supposed to catch someone's attention in the way that that sop is supposed to be like a highlight reel of like you know how you have gone gone about doing things with but it that has to revolve around your the research that you have done or why you are interested in pursuing phd that is what it has to revolve around but but yeah and i know this is not a i cannot perhaps i'm not like answering it this exactly like you know what you are like you know what you want me to answer i'm not exactly asking what you really want me to uh, talk about but then i think the fact is that your sop is really supposed to reflect what you think the reader should know about you so it doesn't necessarily have to be like a story like you know so you can write uh, they are like you can divide your sop in like sections also and in those different sections you can emphasize different things uh so that's right. also okay but again so like your sop really has to be so yeah sorry if i'm not expressing this right uh, in the best way possible but how exactly your that's SOP one more thing like, so like that's like any other essay i mean the toughest thing sorry please go on no, go on okay yeah i am saying that just like any other essay which we have uh, tried to write i mean the toughest thing must be how to start right so what is your opinion on how one should start an sop does it start with a bland introduction that this is my name i'm from your so on or uh, does it start with something else like uh, what's your opinion on that from what you have seen uh so like okay so like if you, if you are confused about this part then i would encourage you to Uh, like you know, have a look at the SOP of SOPs of people who are already in graduate school or graduated in the past, and I think you should be able to find this. In some cases, you should be able to find like examples of SOPs like online if you just Google this. In some cases, you can like you know perhaps reach out to people you know and ask for their SOPs and see like how they approach this. Okay, fine. Oh uh, yeah, thanks. But yeah, it doesn't it 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 is not supposed to be. It is not like you're not supposed to go about it as like you know this is my name and so and so. 
but you can maybe start it as like you know to talk you can start it uh, as in you can talk about like what you are interested in and why you want to do your phd this is something i can start with and from there you can go on and talk about the things that you are interested in and or like you know if you have uh, yeah like the things the different topics that uh, sorry so from there you can go on or go on and talk about the, uh, the research experience that you have gained over the years and along with that uh, if there are if there have been any struggles perhaps that you have had over the years or the topic that you are interested interested in and why is it that you are interested in that you can expand a bit on these things like in the following paragraphs in the first paragraph you can just give like a summary of what you are interested in and why you are interested in it uh, in, but again this is just one example there are many different ways you can go about it so again for that i think a great thing would be to reach out to people uh, and ask for perhaps for their uh, sob Okay. Yeah, thanks for your help. Uh so right now uh actually if we just stop like if we uh continue the questions will be going on because it's a very vast topic to debate and talk about. But uh like uh since it's way beyond the time limit. So we really thank Akash Gupta to be here sharing his experience and valuable points uh for all experience and everything okay just one last question that that is there uh what you uh, talk about like how one should uh, pursue towards taking the grant like you got a grant of finest uh how did you get uh, towards achieving this grant and what the things that you think is very important one should focus on if you if you want a grant So again, so like, uh, so for grants, like you know, once you like start your PhD program, you will perhaps will start working with some researcher, some professor, and while working on that, like you know, you will have your own research problem, and once you have a research problem, you can like you know elaborate. So basically, for these grants, so like the grant that I have, this future investigators, sorry, future investigators in NASA space, uh, and so on and so. Uh, for this grant basically i was supposed to submit a research proposal like a five page research proposal where i basically discussed the things that i've already done in the past and i was proposing like a couple of research problems that i will work on if i do get this grant and like so basically what exactly i will work on in the coming 2 3 years uh, because this is like a 3 year grant so like what i will do in the coming 2 3 years so basically i described my research project in the research proposal and again you will get to this stage once you are like you know starting with your phd program and once you have figured out what exactly your research uh, research problem is so so again so i think this is some, not something that you need to worry about that because this will eventually you will come to this at some point but the other thing can be um, the other thing that you will also have to might have to write about is like you know you probably have to write about like write send another sop of sort like a personal statement or sop you will also have to write so like at least i had to do that for this research grant uh, so again there you describe again your like your motivation for the like you know for uh, what you the motivation for the field what you want to do like why you're interested what are the research topics you're interested in and why you're interested in that very briefly then the main part of that personal statement again is that what research experience you have uh, what are the different things you have worked on what your what is your academic background if you have ex- the different awards and those kind of things if you have uh, like you know gotten in the past and and yeah like where you see yourself in the future like what oh, i think i forgot to mention this but this is something you should also mention in your sop that like you know where do you see yourself in the future what is it that your object long term objective is so again sort of an sop is something that i uh, is also something that i had to submit uh, along with it, like a research proposal but again like there are different kinds of grants that you can get uh, they are like much smaller grants also that you can apply for and all these different grants have different requirements some simply require your transcript 
some required some like this this was a research based grant like multi year research based grant so i had to write a research proposal but yeah so that is more or less is how it goes typically depends on your research your your, your typically depends on your research your uh, your research your academics or your extra corrects yeah so basically on these three things more or less all these different sort of sorts of grants that you can apply for okay so this is one last question i'm not uh, think no, we are not taking any questions if a person has done a project research project in a private company in that case but the thing is it's a private company so they would not allow you to uh, publish the results or any of them so talking about that would it help in uh, this, but they can give you at least one uh, certificate or a proof that you have worked on such a problem so would uh, writing about that in the sop help in phd or writing that would be difficult for i mean you should definitely like you know mention that if you have done research at some private company uh, you should definitely mention that uh so yeah, i think that's all i can say on that part uh, definitely like definitely tell them give them all the reasons why they should why they should take you as a graduate student definitely mention all the reasons why they should take you as a graduate student near sop and actually yeah because frankly it's like you're trying to to put it in a way you're trying to be you're trying to sell yourself to the uh to the graduate admissions committee so so yeah try to like you know mention all the because yeah my my question was my master thesis involved with the private company so okay uh, it is make me bound that i cannot publish my work so in that case i was uh, i wanted to ask this so yeah again uh this is a very like specific case so frankly i do not have an answer for this like a proper answer for this off the top of my head but what i can say again is that uh definitely mention this like if it is okay for you to like you know discuss your project then definitely do that and maybe like you know in this case you can ask for your uh, research supervisor at this company uh to write your record letter of recommendation also because in that letter they can mention that like you know how you were working on this project and so and so and how that is contributing to different things or what the kind of work that you have done and in your sop also if it is okay briefly just very briefly describe what you did what the main results were i think that's fine okay thanks yeah and that should definitely help your profile uh okay uh so uh, i think it's a time to conclude thank you guys to be here and we also thank for everyone who has joined and asked the questions you have made uh, it's very, it was very informative uh, we really thank you akash no problem and yeah best luck best of luck uh hope you guys do great in your application process yeah good luck Thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me the chance to share my experience with all of you. It was yeah. a really informative. Thank you.